pomeriggio a tutte e a tutti. Do il benvenuto a questo appuntamento delle Padua Freedom Lecture con ospite il professor Omi Baba. Alle persone qui presenti in sala in Aula Magna di Palazzo Bo e a chi ci segue in streaming nel canale YouTube di Ateneo. Si tratta del quinto appuntamento di questo ciclo inaugurato nel maggio 2020 e dedicato alle declinazioni del tema della libertà, così importante per il nostro Ateneo da essere da 800 anni nel nostro motto e ancora oggi attuale. Vi ricordo che in occasione delle celebrazioni degli 800 anni dell'Università di Padova prevediamo un ricchissimo programma di eventi culturali e spettacoli dedicati alla comunità accademica ma aperti a tutta la a cittadinanza a cui vi invitiamo a partecipare. Per restare aggiornati potete seguire le iniziative nel sito dedicato 800anniunipd.it e restare collegati con tutti i canali social di Ateneo. Un ringraziamento per il sostegno e il contributo alla realizzazione degli eventi legati alle celebrazioni degli 800 anni della nostra Università, alla Fondazione Casa di Risparmio di Padova e Rovigo e alla Camera di Commercio di Padova. Ringraziamo inoltre lo sponsor di questo evento, Poste Italiane. Lascio ora la parola per i saluti istituzionali alla professoressa Silvia Gross, docente del Dipartimento di Scienze Chimiche e membro del Comitato 800, nominato dalla Rettrice in occasione delle celebrazioni degli 800 anni dell'Ateneo. Buonasera. Chiarissimo professor Baba, illustri ospiti, gentili colleghi e colleghe, cari studenti, care studentesse, Benvenuti a tutti in questa magnifica Aula Magna, recentemente restaurata, alla quale è stato riportato l'originario splendore su cui ultimo intervenne, illustre, l'architetto Gio Ponti nel 1942. E con grande emozione, stasera, che porto al professor Baba e dalla nostra comunità accademica i saluti della magnifica rettrice, professoressa Daniela Mappelli, e del Comitato 800 anni, di cui eh, con onore e con piacere faccio, faccio parte. E inauguro questa lezione del professor Baba in occasione appunto dell'odierno appuntamento delle Padova Freedom Lecture. Professor, professor Uomi Baba è docente dell'Università di Harvard, critico, critico letterario internazionalmente riconosciuto e influente teorico della teoria postcoloniali. È oggi il nostro ospite che la, coll la collega professoressa Annalisa Oboe, docente di letteratura anglofona, studi postcoloniali e di genere e direttrice del centro di Ateneo Elena Cornaro eh, per i saperi e le culture e le politiche di genere, tra presenterà tra poco. La libertà è l'oggetto di questa serie di iniziative. La libertà è una cifra da 800 anni del nostro Ateneo, una libertà che ispira la nostra missione, il nostro agire quotidiano, nei nostri laboratori, nelle nostre biblioteche, nelle aule didattiche con i nostri studenti. Ed è rievocata da sempre nel motto secolare, che campeggia anche qui dietro lo schermo, dell'Ateneo, Universo Universis Patavina Libertas. E per rievocare questa pietra miliare che da sempre connota le nostre ricerche, la nostra didattica, il nostro rapporto con la società civile, dal 2020 al 2022 l'Università di Padova ha organizzato questa serie di eventi invitando dieci voci di riferimento del, 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 del panorama internazionale eh, che si esprimono sulle molteplici declinazioni dell'idea e dell'esercizio di libertà. Il 2022, data che tutti vediamo campeggiare ovunque in una città festosamente pavesata di Rosso Pantone 1807, è una data iconica, fondamentale per il nostro Ateneo, ma anche per la città che la ospita orgogliosamente da 800 anni. E lo è per quanti a Padova, in Europa, nel mondo, hanno in questi otto secoli condiviso questo anelito comune a una diffusione di valori, di scienza e cultura a cui fosse sempre sotteso il concerto di Libertas inviolabile e universis, come dice il nostro motto, per tutti. L'Università di Padova è da sempre culla di una libertà declinata anche tra le mura di questo straordinario coacervo di storia e cultura che è il Palazzo del Bosco, soprattutto nella libertà di fare ricerca. Fu proprio per conquistare una maggiore libertas che un nucleo di studenti e docenti fuggirono da Bologna nel 1222 e emigrarono a Padova per non assoggettarsi alle norme statutarie del 1216 che le devano in modo intollerabile le libertas scolarium, le libertà dei docenti e degli studenti. 
La patavina Libertas fu, rimase per sempre e tuttora la cifra fondante del nostro Ateneo. E non lo diciamo solo noi padovani. C'è a questo riguardo un brano molto bello, molto eloquente, evocativo, di das Leben des Galilei, di Bertolt Brecht, La vita di Galileo, in cui il procuratore dello studio del procuratore della Repubblica Serenissima e prova a convincere Galileo, ormai convinto a, ad andare a, ad insegnare a Pisa, a rimanere a Padova. Galileo, che ammise di aver trascorso a Padova gli 18 anni migliori di tutta la mia età, dove fece straordinarie scoperte e dove di fatto prese definitivamente le distanze dalla tradizione aristotelica dominante, e voleva lasciare Padova per motivi Stretta, prevalentemente legati anche a migliori emolumenti che gli avrebbero corrisposto a Pisa. E il procuratore della Serenissima gli fece un ragionamento molto solido, molto convincente. Gli disse, non dimenticate che se la Repubblica Serenissima forse non paga lautamente come alcuni principi, garantisce però la libertà di indagine. Noi a Padova ammettiamo come auditori allo studio Patavino persino dei protestanti. Siamo nel 1610, quindi erano ancora lontani. E gli conferiamo persino il titolo di dottore. Fino in Olanda è risaputo che Venezia è la Repubblica in cui l'Inquisizione non ha diritto di intervento. Qui a Padova potete effettuare le vostre ricerche in libertà. La patavina liberta sarà quella, poter fare ricerca senza coercizioni imposte dall'Inquisizione e dal papato. Poi Galileo non seguì il consiglio del procuratore e sappiamo tutti come andò a finire. Ma la libertà naturalmente non si declina solo nella trasmissione del sapere, della scienza, della cultura, dell'insegnamento, come tra l'altro Interali appunto recita l'articolo 33 della nostra Costituzione, ma è oggi concretamente legata anche al riconoscimento dei diritti degli uomini, delle donne e dei bambini, che proprio in questi giorni drammatici, oscuri, vengono in modo intollerabile violati. E di violazioni di libertà ci parlerà oggi il professor Baba, del quale mi ha colpito molto una frase che ho letto, proprio perché oggi in quest'Aula Magna è drammaticamente attuale. Il professor Baba ha scritto «Se la libertà è fondamentale per la vita umana, perché diviene sfuggente e irraggiungibile nel momento in cui la storia non ne ha più bisogno?» Lascio ora la parola alla professoressa Oboe per l'introduzione del nostro ospite. Grazie. Grazie alla professoressa Silvia Gross, chiamo quindi al podio a introdurre il nostro ospite, la professoressa Annalisa Oboe, docente del Dipartimento di Studi Linguistici e Letterari e direttrice del Centro di Ateneo Elena Cornaro per i saperi, le culture e le politiche di genere. Grazie, buon pomeriggio, buon pomeriggio a tutti e a tutti, ehm, agli studenti, ai colleghi, a chi ci sta seguendo in streaming, e voglio ringraziare anche il nostro staff che come sempre eh, lavora benissimo per questi incontri che per noi sono così importanti viste le celebrazioni um, a questa Freedom Lecture siamo stati chiamate, chiamati dai rintocchi delle campane della libertà questi Chimes of Freedom eh, di cui Bob Dylan cantava negli anni 60, che poi abbiamo sentito ricantare no? come una specie di coro che accompagna eh, questo cammino difficile verso la libertà anche nei, nei decenni seguenti. E, e ce lo ricorda ovviamente il nostro ospite Omi Baba con il titolo suggestivo della sua lezione. Um, e, e questi Chimes of Freedom ci parlano ancora oggi, in un momento che è di guerra per l'Europa, ma anche di celebrazione per noi qui a Padova, che quest'anno festeggiamo questi 800 anni così importanti. È la seconda volta che il professor Homi Baba ehm, ci onora della sua presenza qui in Aula Magna e, e credo, per me è davvero una soddisfazione, un piacere constatare che eh, i nostri eminenti colleghi e colleghe di Atenei prestigiosi del mondo ritornano qui volentieri, eh, come se Padova fosse un po' anche casa loro, e, e si portano anche la famiglia. E, mh, vorrei eh, salutare in questo momento eh, lui e sua moglie, eh, Jackie Baba, eh, che è qui con noi e che è pure un'accademica di Harvard, che si occupa di diritto e diritti umani 
eh, in particolare per i bambini i migranti. Eh, quindi li salutiamo entrambi con un bel applauso, direi. Abbiamo incontrato Omi Baba per la prima volta in questa stessa aula ad un incontro del programma Bo Culture nel 2018 eh, e in quel momento affrontò le questioni che riguardavano le migrazioni contemporanee, i diritti umani e il ruolo delle discipline umanistiche nell'affrontare le tragedie di questo tempo distopico. Oggi lo cogliamo qui eh, in questo luogo rinnovato a festa per parlare di libertà come stiamo facendo con le Padua Freedom Lectures da ormai due anni, e, um, invitando personaggi eccellenti del panorama scientifico, culturale, sociale, sia nazionale che internazionale. Omi Baba è Anne Rotherberg Professor of the Humanities uh, all'Università di Harvard, eh, indiano di origini parsi, è nato a Bombay nel Mumbai nel 1949. Eh, si è formato eh, in India eh, e, e all'Università di Oxford, poi ha insegnato per alcuni anni nelle università britanniche, eh, si è trasferito quindi a Chicago e, e poi a Harvard. A Harvard eh, ha fatto una cosa bellissima per molti anni, ha diretto eh, il centro di studi umanistici Mahindra, ehm, che è famoso per aver aperto in modo molto deciso le humanities alla fertilizzazione inter e transdisciplinare. Eh, sviluppando il lavoro dei pensatori psicanalitici e post-strutturalisti, ma anche il lavoro dell'antillano francofono Franz Fanon, Baba è diventato una voce profondamente originale nello studio delle culture coloniali, post-coloniali, globalizzate e delle migrazioni. È autore di opere famose quali I luoghi della cultura, Nazione e narrazione, in cui rinveniamo quei concetti e quei termini influenti eh, che lui esplora nei suoi saggi, termini come ambivalence, mimicry, hybridity, in-betweenness, third space, che sono centrali alla teoria critica postcoloniale e non solo, perché hanno anche ispirato gli studi di management, la filosofia estetica, l'architettura, gli studi sullo sviluppo e sui diritti umani, la teologia e molti altri ambiti del sapere. La sua opera continua a essere un riferimento essenziale per chiunque sia interessato alle prospettive culturali ibride associate al colonialismo e alla globalizzazione. La teoria critica proposta da Baba, come quella di altri teorici influenti della postcoloniale, quali Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, attinge a una gamma piuttosto imponente di riferimenti teorici che a volte ci sono sembrati davvero troppo complessi da assimilare, e guardo i miei studenti che sono qui, ma Baba ha saputo elaborare per noi una serie di discorsi che illuminano i modi in cui i subalterni, i colonizzati, i dannati della terra, hanno resistito all'autorità dell'Occidente, dei colonizzatori e degli imperi europei. La sua discussione di esempi tratti dall'archivio coloniale non è solo di rilevanza storica. L'ambivalenza che Baba rinviene al cuore del processo della colonizzazione, iniziato nella prima modernità, consente di analizzare gli sviluppi contemporanei che, vengono, che vedono reti globalizzate sempre più complesse accanto a fiere identità locali che si confrontano l'un l'altra. Il suo lavoro ci aiuta a comprendere i modi in cui il colonialismo non rimane chiuso nel passato, non è finito, nonostante le storie importanti e le vittorie dell'anticolonialismo e delle lotte per l'indipendenza nel secondo dopoguerra. Invece, per usare eh, un idioma freudiano che pervade i suoi scritti, il colonialismo ritorna ripetutamente e misteriosamente nel presente. In effetti potremmo probabilmente continuare a descrivere il contesto in cui viviamo eh, ancora oggi come un presente coloniale che implica non solo continue asimmetrie di, nelle relazioni di potere, ma anche la continuazione di forme di resistenza, di negoziazione, di traduzione culturale. Nella lezione di oggi, Homi Baba ci parla di libertà in rapporto ai nazionalismi etnici contemporanei e al razzismo, 
temi che ci interpellano continuamente e che non sono mai superati, mai sconfitti, sempre urgenti per le loro manifestazioni pratiche e per l'impatto devastante che continuano ad avere sulla vita delle persone e anche del pianeta. Ma anche la causa della libertà è stata continuamente riproposta nel corso dei secoli da avvocati, da filosofi. I canti di libertà sono stati cantati nei, corsi di, da, nei secoli da coloro che ne hanno subito la perdita senza perdere però la fiducia nell'idea. Il discorso di oggi si svolgerà attraverso un dialogo ideale con i pensatori postcoloniali, gli scrittori neri e le vittime quotidiane dei conflitti e di traumi razziali per affrontare alcune domande. La prima, la citata la collega Silvia Gross, se la libertà è fondamentale per la vita umana, perché diventa così sfuggente e irraggiungibile quando la storia ne ha più bisogno? E la seconda, se la libertà è essenziale per la civiltà umana, perché così spesso la perdiamo di vista nel creare una società umana? Eh, io mi fermo qui e lascio la parola al nostro ospite. Grazie. Grazie, professoressa Oboe. Invito ora al podio il professor Omi Baba, che ci presenterà la sua lezione dal titolo Chimes of Freedom. Good afternoon <clears throat> to you all. My apologies for not speaking in this great hall in Italian, but uh, believe me that every time I come, and this is the second time I've been here um, at the University of Padua, both times invited by Professor um, Annalisa Oboe, there is in the air a feeling of such distinction, but also a feeling of liberty and freedom. The audiences I've spoken to have such a remarkable mix of students and professors of all generations that when I'm here, I feel deeply honored. Of course, giving the Freedom Lecture is a great honor in itself, But just as an academic, as a scholar, as a thinker, I feel honored to have the audiences that I've had at this university. And I thank you for your invitation, and I thank you for your hospitality. I want to, of course, thank uh, the speakers before me who welcomed me greatly. I want to thank Annalisa Obwe for her invitation, for her warmth and friendship, and I'd like to thank Uh, Franco Schiovan for making so much easier uh, this, whole, um, the, the, this whole project and making things so much easier for me and my wife. I would be de derelict of my duty if I did not thank the translator who is there and for whom I would like to give a hand. Sometimes I can barely understand what I write myself. So to think that these translators uh, uh, have to work with these texts and to give her even more credit, uh, I gave her a text when I walked in half an hour ago and she said, but is this the same one that you sent me f uh, four hours ago? And I said, no, it's not. I've changed it again. So thank you so much for your tolerance and for your remarkable intelligence. Thank you very much. Now, this is a university, of course, which has a great humanistic tradition. Um, as I read about the um, early, middle, uh, early modern period and I think about the controversies between uh, uh, Florentine humanism and humanism here, I'm always on the Padovan side. So uh, let me tell you that it has been uh, a, a, a remarkable uh, ability for me to think about one of the most important ideas of humanism at that period and in this place, uh, 
which speaks to the question of freedom. And that is, humanism is not only about ideas. Humanism was about the possibility of constructing a discourse, of discourse of freedom and negotiation. Humanism is a, is a form, not only a set of ideas, but a form of communication. It is through being able to communicate despite differences that humanism tells us that we are actually human because we are constructed in this relationship of congruence coming together from different places and different views and not of consensus. And that is one of the great ideas, I believe, of Padovan uh, uh, humanism, this coming together, this ability and necessity to speak. And this ability and necessity to speak, <clears throat> to communicate one's ideas and one's values is what our leaders today in many countries have failed to do. Mr. Putin barely speaks except when he speaks in a formal voice in a formal forum. The Prime Minister of India, also an ethno-nationalist populist, Mr. Modi, never speaks in Parliament. He only speaks if he speaks to 50,000 people in a public discourse where he cannot be questioned. This is a symptom of our times when the whole nature of conversation, of debate, discussion, and discourse has been largely silenced. And it is to actually try in a very small way to turn that balance, to turn away from that appalling silence that we hear while people die, while people are in prison, while journalists are while journalists are not allowed to practice their own freedom of speech, their freedom of writing, it's in fact with those ideas that I speak to you today, the very act of speaking, the very act of turning round and speaking to the person beside you without knowing whether you will agree or disagree, that is at the heart of humanism. It's as much a mode of thinking as it is a mode of communication. My talk today ranges over many conditions and many countries, but there are two things which are central. One, the idea of asking not only what is freedom? But what does freedom do? And what do we do with freedom? So to move in a way from the strictly ontological question to the agential question. What do we do with freedom? The second issue is a concept I will talk about which is about the way in which we work, the way in which we construct the chimes of freedom when freedom is denied. When freedom is denied, is it dead? Or when freedom is denied, is there a kind of negative politics that we learn from the denial of freedom that in fact allows us to deepen our sense of the fate of freedom. Very simply, these are two questions I want us to bear in mind. And so I want to start with a quotation from James Baldwin, where he says, in the fire next time, my whole effort is to try to bear witness to something which will have to be there when the storm is over, to help us to get through the next storm. And so I'm going to talk about freedom in the middle of the storm and in the middle of the debris 
of our times in most places. We are rarely prepared for our own times. This opening sentence has the feel of a cliché. It sounds like a truism that carries little truth, a pious statement undone by its own sentimentality. To be unprepared for our own times is a commonplace phrase repeated in melancholic moments, in the afterlife of despair and defeat, in the vain search for consolation, or for the impossibility of 2020 vision. The tone of the phrase comes not from a sense of a failed past, but an anxiety associated with the anticipation of a recurrent failure or loss in the future, whenever the tragic untimeliness of human self-awareness falls in the face of historical happenstance. Should I have known better? Should we not have been, more war been warned more fully? Why were we so unprepared for something that lay in waiting for us stealthily shared our days and nights and kept its head down while we raised ours in what we thought were songs of freedom. Bob Dylan's civil rights anthem, The Chimes of Freedom, catches the tempo of my, the turn of my phrase, we are rarely prepared for our own times. When Dylan sings of the moment when, he says, the seeming chimes of freedom flashing turn into the thunderbolts tolling history's death knell, he provides me with a perfect introduction to my talk. Now, if I could sing like Bob Dylan, you may not have had my company today. The fact that I can't sing like Bob Dylan, I'm here and delighted to be here. So what I will do is I will just read you like a poem, the first two stanzas of, the, um, of his great song, The Chimes of Freedom, which was later uh, adopted by Amnesty International as its anthem. Far between sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll, we ducked inside the doorway, thunder went crashing as majestic bells of bolt struck shadows in the sounds seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing, flashing for the warriors whose strength is not to fight, flashing for the refugees on the unarmed road of flight, and for each and every underdog soldier in the night, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. In the city's melted furnace, Unexpectedly, we watched with faces hidden as the walls were tightening around us, as the echo of the wedding bells before the blowing rain dissolved into the bells of the lightning, tolling for the rebel, tolling for the rake, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsaked, tolling for the outcast, burning constantly at stake, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Of late, history has frequently caught us short, and we have been unprepared for our present. We were unprepared for COVID, which the historian of science, Lorraine Daston, described as catapulting us back to the 17th century, she said, we are living at the moment of COVID in a, mo in a moment of ground zero empiricism in which almost everything is up for grabs. We were also unprepared in a different scale and a different time, but a time that coalesced with the 8.45 minutes that it took for a police officer to kill George Floyd as we saw a global protest emerge against police violence and racial injustice across the world, 
criminal injustice has a long institutional racial history, but catapulted by those few passing minutes in Minneapolis, the Black Lives Matter movement lent into risk, as they say, and in the words of Barbara Ransby, one of its prominent academic activists, suddenly the in-between interstitial spaces between organizations, the spaces that kept organizations apart, came together, fused together, and a solidarity was formed when the race struggle around the world found a new beginning. What does it mean to be unprepared for something that has a long history of happening? <clears throat> Recorded pandemics have occurred for several hundreds of years. Police killings of black Americans, men and women, in avoidable and unjust circumstances are part now of a recurrent cycle of systemic racial violence while cross-border invasions, such as we see today in Ukraine, are regrettably very much part of our present-day geopolitical perils. And these cross-border interventions are not only those that tyrannical states inflict upon others. Democratic states have done very much the same thing, too, since 9-11. In a matter of weeks, a country, the Ukraine, becomes destroyed and a large part of the population is displaced. These are circumstances in which being unprepared for the present may be an inflection point, one that primes you for becoming an effective oppositional agent taking you back at first and then giving you the opportunity to recover and right yourself, making yourself ethically upright, making yourself a friend to rights in order to stand up against the illegitimate uses of power and the abuse of authority. Thought of in this way, the panicky moment of unpreparedness might well prepare you to live up to the responsibility of taking action under pressure and making decisions in relation to risk as they shape the citizens' consciousness of present-day crises. And in fact, one of the great gifts of James Baldwin, not only to African Americans, but to oppressed minorities everywhere, is to suggest that the question of risk has to be taken. Risk is a moral question in opposing systems of illegitimate or indeed dominating power. Risk is an extremely important moral category. However, increasingly with rampant disregard for facts, science, history, and human dignity, those who occupy the highest offices in, this, in most powerful countries around the world are actively unpreparing their citizens and residents to stand up for their democratic rights and representations and actively policing them to stop their ability to organize in the interests of their rights and responsibilities. This leads to the worst excesses of ethno-nationalist social polarization within the nation and to the fascistic annexation of peoples beyond the nation's boundary, as we have just observed with Russia's brutal incursion into Ukraine. In these contexts, I hear again Dylan's voice flashing for the warriors whose strength is not to fight, flashing for the refugees on the unarmed road of flight, and for each and every underdog soldier in the night, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Nothing could be more true of those who are today fighting for Ukraine's freedom. They are civilians who are put in the place of warriors. Their place is not to fight. Refugees, over two million, are on the road of flight and for each and every underdog, 
because soldiers too are underdogs. In the night we gaze upon the freedom, the chimes of freedom flashing. These flashes of freedom, these fragile chimes of freedom darkened by the tolling of rolling and roiling thunder has a long Ukrainian history. In a stirring essay, We're All Ukrainians Now, the Polish writer Adam Michkin recalls Ukraine's, as he calls it, stubborn heroic years of struggle, victims of Russification and deprivation, discrimination and repression, victims of Stalinist terror and Nazi occupation. And then Michkin refers to Putin's neo-fascist invasion and he questions the history of the present. The full consequences of this are beyond the scope of our imagining. We are rarely ever prepared for our own present. He goes on to ask, are we witnessing the beginnings of a worldwide war? He answers his own question in a very different way. In every generation, the Ukrainians have always repeated the glory of Ukraine and then followed it with a phrase, Ukraine is not yet lost. This statement of perseverance and purpose is clear in its political intent, but its affective and aspirational aura is complex. Clarity lies in the courage of the collective Ukrainian will to survive, to protest and protest and protect its freedom. But the complexity lies in the melancholic memories of generations of Ukrainians who have lived at the limits of liberty with their sense of the present day, the contemporary, the temporal presentness of history shrouded by repeated anxiety of a precarious loss of freedom in the future. When you say Ukraine is not yet lost, you live exactly in that tension of fragility. Not yet lost, not yet, not yet, but when? In the near or distant future. This tentative temporality of transition, this sense of the provisionality of freedom keeps Ukrainians on tenterhooks, at the edge of its nerves, as if the present day is suspended in a proleptic anticipation of abjection and abeyance, waiting for the barbarians. Will futurity bring back the lost freedoms of the past into the present tense, like the memory of trauma repeated and revitalized? Will the lost freedoms of the past be anticipated in a contingent future that turns its back upon us again and turns into an untimely and uncanny historical present. To understand what it means to live in the present for which we are unprepared, though not uninformed, to exist within the dynamics of a shrouded freedom increasingly imposed on polarized populations worldwide by ethno-nationalist regimes, we have to ask, I believe, the Foucauldian question. What is our present? Our pursuit, I believe, is best served in Foucault's view, not by a Kantian analytics of truth, <laughs> the conditions in which true knowledge is possible, but by what might be called an ontology of the present, an ontology of ourselves. What does it mean to comprehend a historical event from the perspective of the ontology of the present. And the ontology of the present is not only the long history or tradition. The ontology of the present is what the moment of being of, that, of, of the present. How does the present constitute itself as a medium of living, being, and existing for ourselves and for others? How do we write our contemporary histories by exploring the ontology of ourselves? This is a large and unwieldy question, but it cannot be avoided, however tentatively, in a freedom lecture delivered in wartime, in Padua, as, as we remain unprepared for the future of Ukraine and 
Europe, and the world. Thunder went crashing as majestic bells of bolts struck shadows in the sound, seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing. The ontology of the present must not be understood or misunderstood as presentism, as an exclusive focus on the truth conditions or the social circumstances of the present day at the cost either of historical recall and report or moral speculations on future dilemmas. Indeed, the very phrase, Ukrainian freedom is not yet lost, is what amounts to an indicative mood, verb mood, an indicative mood that ironically expresses both strong persistent survival, not yet lost, and dire prognostication of the future. The political vision of the not yet builds its sense of the survival of present day history by projecting a sovereign future which is nonetheless constructed on the basis of losses, risks of past experiences of national freedom. And I believe that this is, of course, intensely true of Ukraine today, but I think it is also true of many other countries. This sense of sovereignty in which we live and then sovereignty has to, be, has to be survived. Sovereignty fails and the condition of survival starts. So I think freedom, freedom in particular, national freedoms, rather than individual freedom, although it's true of individual freedom too, lives on this borderline, which is why I have said that I'm interested in the borderline, in the limits of freedom, um, and not simply in a, in, a, in a discourse about what freedom is, but what freedom does, how freedom is practiced or unpracticed. I'm interested in this uh, provisionality of freedom. The loss of freedom may have been overcome as a national project, but the historical record and psychic memory of repeated losses of autonomy live on projectively in the precarious tense of the provisional. Freedom not yet lost, which winds itself like a spiral around the traumatic experience of loss. The will to freedom and survival circling the void of death and loss, remembering, repeating, and working through, in Ukraine's case, Russification, Nazification, Stalinism, and now Putinism. So the ontology of freedom always has this core, which is threatened by provisionality. It's, it has to be worked around and worked with. This is why I quote, of course, in passing Freud's great essay, remembering, repeating, and working through. That's the nature, I believe, of freedom as a virtue, freedom as a value, and freedom as a sustaining agency-giving um, uh, will. The ontology of the Ukrainian present lives on in a state of traumatic anticipation. In every generation, Ukraine is not yet lost. From this Ukrainian speech act of hope and solidarity, strengthened by the anxious and ambivalent vigilance of loss and resistance, we learn a critical lesson on the importance of negative politics in the domain of freedom it's a lesson that the philosopher Avishai Margalit teaches better than anyone else. Margalit writes, it is injustice, not justice, which brings us into normative politics. Despotism, not freedom. Moral political theory should start with negative politics. The politics that informs us on how to tackle evil before it tells us how to pursue the good. Thus, negative moral politics should be able to provide us with the moral vocabulary adequate for coping with them. With the erosion of the moral values of normative politics across the world in many aspects and regions, I believe our ethical vocabulary must be informed or reformed by thinking through what Margaret calls negative politics. The long history of the chimes of freedom are not yet lost, but generations of Ukrainians, Indians, Turks, and Russians, and Palestinians, amongst others,
have lived in earshot of the tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsaked. We live, of course, with the suspended fear that unless the international community acts more vigorously in the defense of Ukrainian freedom, it might result in total loss or the maintenance of the Ukrainian feature, future in a state of, uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a deeply compromised state. Today, the devil's anthem of lost freedoms is heard on a global scale. Freedoms for Muslim in India, almost lost. For Palestinians in Israel, almost lost. For Jews in Poland, almost lost. For Uyghurs in China, totally lost. For Kurds in Turkey, totally lost. For women and gays in Afghanistan, totally lost. And then, Dylan's words again, through the city's melted furnace, unexpectedly we watched with faces hidden as the walls around us were tightening. Is negative politics a pessimism of freedom? On the contrary, freedom's precarity or provisionality, as I have argued, is an impetus to independence. In the, much the same spirit, James Baldwin argues in The Fire Next Time that long histories of oppression and violence have never deterred African Americans from be believing that the white American future is, as he puts it, as bright or as dark as our own. And black Americans, to use Baldwin's phrase, recognize this in a negative way, in a form of negative freedom. It is the impetus of this negative way that Baldwin talks about in relation to what I've talked about as negative politics that institutionalizes and indeed inaugurates black struggles in the United States even today. So this notion of the negative, <clears throat> I'm happy to talk about it later, <clears throat> is more to do with transition, more to do with the idea of freedom as an important transitional form, and less to do with the Hegelian notion of the dialectics of negation. Within the debris of dem democracy's projects and promises, the sign of freedom still stirs in the dust. Freedom has long been celebrated as a universal value, a, a foundational modern right. However, I believe the critical state of freedom is twofold. Freedom as a moral and political principle is the arbiter of rights, equality, justice, capability, and well-being. As an ideal virtue in many convergent countries and cultures, freedom has gained a universal symbolic presence, as if it were set in stone. The second aspect of freedom's critical state is its ability to push the moment of tyranny to a crisis. Freedom's chime makes a principled intervention at times, prepared at times, unprepared at others, in conditions of unfreedom to bring the moment to its crisis to initiate a crisis of political, of political authority, legitimation, and hopefully the transition and transfer of power. Freedom then, with both these aspects, is a principle whose, center, whose central force lies in agency, in agency, in what you do with freedom, rather than with what freedom is in a more constitutional sense. And in this context, I recall Hannah Arendt, who argues <clears throat> that freedom as a principle lies in action. And I quote her, in the performing act itself and in distinction from its goal, the principle of an action can be represented time and time again. And the whole nature of the principle of freedom is that it lies in action and it is not given for once and for all. 
It is continually a, a reparative and continually iterative process. The idea of freedom can, can be contemplated in stillness, but the principle of freedom can only be activated in action or in movement. Arendt's insistence on freedom as manifested in public performative action itself provides an insight into the raison d'etre of what we call movement politics. We call movement politics the politics where we gather, sometimes organize, sometimes not, to make a plea for freedom, to make a claim for freedom, is, I believe, involved in this whole idea that freedom is in the movement of freedom, or what Arendt calls in the public and performative action <clears throat> itself. So we often discuss the gatherings, the assemblies of freedom as demonstrations, marches, assemblies, protests, strikes. Indeed, when we associate the struggle for freedom with the action of political movements and politics as movement itself, we are actualizing the ontology of the principle of freedom which relies on a critically timely intervention in the present moment of political crisis. Freedom does not sit still. The human trouble arises when the freedom to seize the moment, neither before or after, but to be free to act in time. It is not that we have always the talent to act at the right time, but we must be free to be able to act in time, even as we are unprepared, as I said, in both senses unprepared for what is happening, but prepared for it in another sense that we know about it. So we sh freedom demands that we can, our demand for freedom is that we should be able to act in the time of our choosing. <clears throat> when the temporal concurrence of holding a principle and acting on it is denied, then there is a loss of freedom. Freedom's performance is arrested and freedom is disappeared, as is the fate of dissidents, minorities, and freedom fighters, it is history's irony that when one is unprepared for the present, as we were for the full response to the death of George Floyd, one can act punctually at times in freedom's course. But the punctuality is something that we have, must have the right to take the risk to freedom and a society must allow us the possibility of taking that risk. Otherwise, I do not believe that freedom has a democratic face. Politics, as we say, is all about timing, which is the problem of unpreparedness with which I started. Men and women are free as distinguished from possessing the gift of freedom, aren't rights, as long as they act neither before or after, for to be free and to act are the same. Arendt's argument is not about the punctuality of freedom, as I've been saying. It is more an observation about the performative act of freedom. Freedom begins with the right to movement and the embodied agency of action, of gathering, protesting, marching. The subject is both literally and metaphorically moved by freedom's iterative force. In politics, you say, I'm moved by the cause. And being moved by the cause is the thought of movement in the ontology of freedom. To be human and to be free is one and the same, Arendt continues. God created man and woman in order to introduce into the world the faculty of beginning, which is freedom. So freedom is about movement. The politics of freedom is the choice of your time to move in a democratic society, to take the risk to move, and the ability of the society or the culture to be able to think of a new beginning, 
Arendt's meditation on freedom is deeply connected to my own argument today. You heard it in Dylan's performance of the Chimes of Freedom flashing. You heard it again in the movements of generations of Ukrainians marching and chanting, glory to Ukraine, Ukraine is not yet lost. The decolonizing movements of our times, be it Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, or the Arab Spring, or Me Too, have all sought new beginnings in the sense in which Arendt associates the action of beginning with the principle of freedom. And the other great idea about uh, prin the principle as an iterative, performative issue is that it allows you to think about what I call negative freedom. It's not simply that freedom is gained or freedom is lost. That freedom is this process of actually trying to understand from the loss what the new beginning of freedom would be, what the next action would be. <clears throat> the significance of the work of Franz Fanon is associated with Arendt's notion of the action of beginning with the principle of freedom at its, at its forefront. Very few declarations of a new freedom have inspired our contemporaries and the contemporaries of current movements as consistently as Fanon's aspirational ending to the wretched of the earth. The third world, he said, must start over a new history of the human, which takes account of not only the occasional prodigious theses maintained by Europe, but also its crimes, the most heinous of which has been the committed at the very heart of man. But then, as he utters his last words on the matter, Fanon stands on the threshold of a revisionary hospitality, not without anxiety and hostility, and calls for, what he, for, calls for a new humanism that transcends the sum of its parts. In that act, Fanon attempts to suture not suppress the wounds of the colonial past. For he says something which is so extraordinarily important for our own times, stretching from the mid 20th century moments of anti colonial freedom to the desperate moments that we are suffering today with ethno nationalist populism. He says if nationalism is not expanded, enriched, and deepened, if it does not very quickly turn into a social and political consciousness into humanism, then it leads to a dead end. A bourgeois leadership of the underdeveloped countries confines the national consciousness to a sterile formalism. It is then that flags and government buildings cease to be the symbols of the nation. And this notion of humanism Articulated by Fanon, the great revolutionary thinker, the radical psychoanalyst, and the leader who called for an armed struggle. For him, he, the first principle of humanism is both to critique Europe but, as he says, to be in conversation with it. You cannot not be in conversation with something that has been in your past a negative but consistent presence. The other great idea of Fanon is you cannot actually leave your enemy along the way and march on. You have to bear responsibility for a kind of revitalization, a kind of resuscitation. And I think that this is one of the most brilliant issues around freedom. Freedom as the possibility of acting with risk in time and of also making a new beginning that is something that we have lost in our national politics, leave alone our international or regional politics. Fanon was talking about the regional politics of the third world. The third world was not as a concept nationalist. It was regionalist. But it had to be in conversation 
It had to be in conversation, even in critical conversation, of its inheritances and its lineages. My focus, of course, today is more on the United States as I end. And I want to end with a very interesting and I think very significant thought of Michel Foucault's in his um, uh, essay, Society Must Be Defended. Society Must Be Defended was a, a remarkable um, series of um, almost disparate thoughts about security in our time, and he never actually finished that seminar. He decided he abandoned it. But what Foucault said was that when we think about the threats of the anti-democratic threats that exist within democracy, when we think of the suppression of freedom within democracy, when we think of what he called the right to kill within democracy, and he did not mean the right to murder, he meant the right to deprive, the right to impoverish, the lack of equity. He makes that very clear. That when we think of these dehumanizing, that's the word, these dehumanizing moments within democracy, within Western democracy, we have to think of them as a long delayed, in that Freudian sense, a long delayed repetition or reincursion of the West's history of colonization. That is where modernity in a way, liberal modernity, liberal secular modernity, managed to learn and legitimate the destruction of racialized others in the main while themselves seeing themselves as the proponents of liberalism. And Fanon says, this is what has returned in our societies, in Nazi societies, in fascist societies, tyrannical societies. It's a return of that right to kill in a broad sense, the right of social death, not only death, which in fact has returned and is now legitimated against minorities in the, in, in the greater part. And in fact, funnily enough, all this is not something that is at the center of uh, Arendtian studies. Arendt, in, in the origins of totalitarianism, says something very similar. She says there is a boomerang effect on Western modernity. Its institutions have become, uh, freedom have become calcified and have become carceral because it had learned, it had tasted blood, if I might put it that way, metaphorically, it had tasted blood in someone else's country, in the colonized country, or on some other bodies. Let me end, then, by talking about, very briefly, about the fact that to be racially tethered, to be racially tethered, to be fixed like a chemical solution is fixed in a dye, as Fanon put it, is a, is a form of trauma Freud associates quite explicitly with what he calls warlike circumstances that involve the risk of fatality. The fixation to the moment of the traumatic accident, Freud writes, lies at the root of traumatic neurosis. The affective coloring, Freud's phrase, of a traumatic experience is excessively powerful, he explains. The temporal economy of the traumatic neurosis is, according to Freud, an experience which, within a short period of time, presents the mind with an increase of stimulus too powerful 
to be dealt with or worked out in the normal way, and this results in permanent disturbances of the manner in which energy operates. Trauma, the traumatic ontology of freedom, or freedom's trauma, which is what I've been talking about, resembles in many ways this particular notion that it is fixated to a moment of loss, but that moment of loss returns, but it returns, Freud says, not simply to defeat you, but as an immediate task which has not been dealt with, and so we take this view quite seriously, that every traumatic moment, and I've discuss this, the, the negative politics, the trauma of freedom, the trauma of freedom's ontology, the necessity of actually being deprived of the time of movement, the time of risk. These traumatic or negative political features, from, uh, 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 Freud says, are traumatic not only in the harms they do, but those who've been traumatized, either psychoanalytically or politically, feel that they have to be involved in the task of working out and working through the trauma. So if, you're, if you talk about psychoanalysis, then that's a particular process. If you talk about freedom, the task of freedom has to be, has to, the task of freedom has to be taken up not only as a positive moral normative politics, what is freedom, but the task of freedom has to be taken up even more actively when that notion of the traumatic, which is the notion of Ukraine is not, has not lost its freedom yet. Ukraine has not yet lost its freedom. That not yet is the condition I believe we are in and that not yet is the kind of traumatic moment of our current ethno-nationalist regimes. They put us in. They put us in that not yet space. But that not yet space is both a space of trauma and a space of recovery and, most important, of course, a state of resistance. We are then compelled to come to terms with freedom's possible futures even as they fly past us unprepared, sometimes half understood, sometimes never fully seen, who knew three weeks ago or a month ago that we would be where we are today, although we always knew of Russia's attitude to Ukraine. But who knew? Were we, uh, how were we so unprepared for something we already knew. And that is, I think, the crux where you hold on to freedom because it helps you to deal with that moment. We are compelled to come to terms with freedom's possible futures even as they fly past us in short moments. How long will this protest last, people ask? How long will this movement last? These are absolutely the right questions to ask so long as we don't believe that there is a right answer to them. In asking these questions, we prepare ourselves for, a, for a, a political temporality of speech and action for which we may not as yet, for which we may as yet be unprepared, but which enables us to act in the negative capability of freedom beyond the long-lasting politics of evolutionary reform. The intimation of the future's present is often an untimely moment. It disturbs our sense of historical duration and political direction. It bewilders us and renders us belated to ourselves. Our freedom is not yet lost, which makes us belated to ourselves because we project ourselves in a place in which it may be lost, and yet we are in a place in which it is not yet lost. This intimation of the future's present is often an untimely moment. It disturbs our sense of historical duration and political direction. It often bewilders us 
and renders us belated. At the same time, it is from within such disruption and disorientation that we move closer to Franz Fanon's complex call to freedom and resistance, framed for his moment and ours in these words from the wretched of the earth. Each generation, he writes, must discover its mission, by which he means its mission for freedom, fulfill it or betray it in relative opacity, which is in a way being the theme of my talk, the relative opacity of freedom. Freedom as a condition in extremis ontologically and freedom as we demand it in moments of, in moments of distress and duress. So freedom is itself ontologically in a condition of relative opacity. <clears throat> True, as Fernand's words are, opacity isn't all. In discovering our mission for freedom, however tentative and turbulent it may be, Women and men are summoned by the chimes of freedom as well as the tolling of the dark storm to find a new beginning in dire circumstances. Ukraine is not yet lost, and to acknowledge in awe and anxiety at the same time to be human and free is one and the same. God created men and women in order to introduce into the world a faculty of beginning, freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Grazie al professor Baba, che ora prego di fermarsi al centro della sala e di prendere posto insieme richiamo alla professoressa Annalisa Oboe, professor Marcello Ghilardi, docente di estetica presso il Dipartimento di Filosofia, Sociologia, Pedagogia e Psicologia Applicata. So, I, I think we all need to thank Professor Baba for such a dense and thought-provoking lecture. Um, this, this, in a nutshell, freedom as a possibility of acting with risk in time for a new beginning. We need to note that. <laughs> we need to keep it in mind. And as we try and reason around his uh, inputs, that is really um, an unforgettable kind of um, contribution. I, I would like to um, let Marcello start uh, the discussion today. Marcello is a philosopher. He is mostly in aesthetics, uh, aesthetic philosophy. Um, but of course, having worked with uh, deconstructive thinking. <laughs> he uh, is well aware of many of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about today. And uh, uh, also, I think he has a way of tackling the things, his things, uh, in, um, um, in, in engaging ways. Uh, so I let him start, because I know he starts from the beginning of your talk. Is that so? <laughs> yes, in a certain way, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. But I have to say that I, I feel myself caught in a bundle of questions and, and topics I would like to deal with. But uh, um, 
preparing this opportunity and this occasion of, of dialogue, I had uh, also the chance of going through your, your lecture, the draft of, of your speech. But hearing you just a few minutes ago, I felt that I was caught in what we could call an event, also in a Derridium meaning. So, in fact, I was not prepared. That's unpreparedness. And so I, I think I, I won't follow these, the, the drafts I, I wrote before, and I will try to go directly to some sensations and some suggestions. Um, of course, you, you talked about being moved, being moved from a cause by a cause. And in fact, I was talking to Annalisa some days ago. I was moved by the quotation from Bob Dylan's song. And I was wondering about the fact that sometimes we are moved more by poetry or literature than from philosophy when we are confronted with something that hits the point about justice and injustice or, or freedom. And my, my first question was if uh, uh, we have, how can we translate into the language of philosophy of argumentation what poetry, literature, music can show in a very direct way? So, this was my first question, but now I would like to ask you um, a second question that's immediately linked to this first one. And maybe just mm, taking a hint from my unpreparedness. We live in a society, in, in modernity, societies, my impression is that uh, tried, and we are continuously trying to be safe to be in a secured situation, to be prepared, to expect what we are likely to confront us with. But freedom is exactly the opposite. We can't have freedom without unpreparedness. So is it a contradiction? your opinion, how can we uh, try to go towards freedom, to enhance freedom, to foster the possibilities for freedom, and at the same time trying to be always uh, without uh, uh, this unpreparedness, uh, without this unexpectedness. I think this is a very important uh, theme at stake, and I think that uh, we should also reconsider the very basis of our modern society. Uh, Marcello, thank you very much. Um, Hello. Yeah. Right. Um, I thank you very much, and I particularly thank you for um, uh, abandoning your notes and giving yourself to what you called in the Derridian sense, the event. Because in a way, uh, what you meant by the event is of course not this great and wonderful event, but the way in which a text produces its own event, even in the speaking, it's rather like, Arendt saying that it's only in the performative moment that the agency of freedom has. If you sit at home and think, I'm free, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. When you start writing something and the press comes down, and the government comes down on you, then you know, I don't have my freedom. Or what, so, yeah. I, let me just tell you something. The work on unpreparedness is actually very new. It's a, by now it's about a year old, and I never knew that I was going to go there. And so I was very unprepared, completely unprepared. Um, I was asked to give, uh, in the very um, middle of the pandemic, I had agreed to give a keynote, and 
the topic was, you know, something that I, that immediately I could recognize very easily and people would recognize me very easily for that topic and I said, this isn't going to work. And I began to think about this notion of the unprepared, which of course has links to some of my earlier work also. But it's, but particularly with the question of the, of, of the unprepared, what it's made me think of is the, is temporality. The time of being, in the Heideggerian sense, but, or, and or being in time, quite literally to take that title, but also how time comes upon you. The pandemic, in a way, we knew that from the 16th, from the 12th century, there have been pandemics, and Lorian Daston says, who's the great historian of science, she says, today we are in zero degree empiricism, you know. I, so, and it is true, either people went back and did long histories of, 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 of pandemics at the moment of the pandemic, or they took endless essays on Camus, you know. And I just thought that is so boring. That's what they did. Why? Because they were trying to create a past and a future. But what if there are moments when you are unprepared? How do you confront it? And even how do you describe that event? How do you write it? That was my issue. How do you think it as a concept and how to write it? When I started thinking about that, and I've got pages and pages and pages on that, which I have to still revise, I also then thought of another form of unpreparedness, which has very much to do with the political regimes of our time. <clears throat> Mr. Modi in India, knowing that there was an emergency, eventually made it official, uh, for the, made the pandemic official, and asked people to leave the city to clear the city out within four hours on the 25th of March. So this city of Bombay, city of Delhi, teeming with millions, were told, within four hours, I want to see nobody on the streets. Now, there were two things that struck me there. One was the unpreparedness of the event and two was the way in which time is being used now, politically, short periods of time. Short periods of time from which citizens have to be prepared because of the exercise of power to be able to obey, otherwise you have the police on the street. Exactly the same thing in the States, they, in, in, of course in China, they knew three weeks or four weeks before that this was a serious pandemic, and yet there was that dead period, and then all of a sudden people were told, lockdown within the next two days. So this made me think of this paradox, that there is a form of affective unpreparedness, right? The, it's, which is not only affective, but it's also an ethics of everyday life. And there is, at the same time, a practice of citizen forming or citizen shaping that slowly erodes the freedoms of one way or another, either, ex either uh, uh, it expressively or by putting pressure or by increasing the number of police on the road, or by, uh, you know, by doing various things of that kind. So I began to think of these two forms of unpreparedness. The other moment, of course, for me, was uh, um, George Floyd. Of course we knew there had been um, generations. In fact, I, you know, while reading this paper, I was editing it from there. I was, because I didn't want to keep our friends waiting too long. So I was editing even, I edited it an hour, two hours before giving it, but I edited it here, which is why the aesthetic part of it I didn't even read. But George Floyd, I mean, we knew this. We, we knew that in the last decade, 90 times the word I can't breathe has been used. 
by black and white people arrested by the police. We know that, and yet the disproportionately large part of that has been black people. Now, George Floyd dies in Minneapolis on a street corner. And then in Iraq, people are drawing murals. And in Bombay, people are drawing murals. And they're not making him into a hero. They are making an event in the Foucauldian or Derridian sense. They're saying, now in our world, this is the condition which we are in, whether it's in India or whether it's in Turkey or whether it's in Iraq. So that also made me think, you know, of being unprepared for something you know quite well. And freedom, when you asked me to give the freedom lecture, I thought the question of freedom was v fitted very well with, with this issue. Does that, Ansi, give you a sense of your... Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I um, follow up from this event? <laughs> I'm also unprepared. Uh, in fact, I have a set of questions that I I've wrote down. I've given you all excuses for being unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, I was thinking, the state of unpreparedness, um, can we think of it of, uh, in, uh, not, not just in negative terms, but in positive terms, yeah. and as a state of staying open, I was thinking of David, as I say, on hospitality and the fact that you're not, it is not hospitality if you, uh, you know, are willing to um, host a guest that you know. Uh, but real hospitality is to stay open to the unexpected, is to not know what will happen or whether you will be prepared for it, but you can only um, welcome the future or a new beginning if you stay open. Isn't this the state that would allow uh, to keep freedom in our own yeah. landscape? Yes, well, that is why I, I started, in fact, with that form of unpreparedness. When I say there are circumstances in which being unprepared for the present is an inflection point that allows you to become an agent. So yes, I think that, that I, I put that first and then being unprepared by, by government and politics. Um, I, I, I think so. Now, of course, we are um, 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 on that borderline of Derrida and Levinas, uh, and even Kant, and even Kant. Um, let me say, I, I very much um, um, ag agree with this idea of, of openness. Um, and of course, that's why I'm talking about the unprepared here in relation to freedom. <clears throat> and freedom as a liminal case, not freedom as a you know, written in stone idea. But I have some problems with uh, this notion of unconditional freedom. Uh, unconditional hospitality. Yes. I also have a problem with unconditional freedom, which is the James Baldwin idea. But with unconditional hospitality, I do have some issues. It is a remarkable, um, uh, it's a remarkable idea, you know, and it's a very aspirational idea. But my sense is, that to be unprepared is also to be deeply anxious and ambivalent at the same time. It is to be anxious and ambivalent. And it seems to me that hospitality has to be able to deal with the anxiety of both the host and the guest. And that's what I find less strongly put in, 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 in Derrida. And uh, that's one of the things I'm writing about in my, in my book at the moment, that the notion of anxiety uh, is extremely important and how you deal with that anxiety, and it, which is about anxiety in facing alterity.
if you don't feel anxious about it, if you don't feel, um, uh, if, if you don't feel lost at the point of hospitality, you know, then that hospitality is not uh, substantive. You know, it's substantive to say, yes, please come and have, you know, please come and have, to come and stay with me, be with me, and my door is always open. But, you know, then for how long is that door open, and what about very important issues to deal with it? So let me tell you, I've just written a piece <clears throat> which has just come out in a new, as the preface to a new book on, on, on Fanon, Fanon's phenomenology and, um, and ontology. And, it's in, it, and I found a, a, a piece in Fanon where he talks about um, the, the, the stranger, as you know, uh, it, the, the guest is always usually either a stranger, a foreigner, you know, the, that's the, even in Greek times, this is the way, or the traveler. These are the three terms usually used. And Fanon is talking about this particular bounded space in, in, in Algeria, in rural Algeria, called a douar. A douar might be, I don't know, a community of ex, a village or something like that. And he says, um, without really developing the idea, which I then try and do, he says, when the traveler comes to the douar, the, 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 the members of this community immediately recognize in him, it's masculine, it could be, uh, a, a co-religionist. He's another Muslim, he's another Algerian. They speak, he speaks to them, and they immediately invite him in. And when they invite him in, they feed him. And which, of course, in the Greek tradition is, the, it is one of the most important. How long do you keep somebody on the threshold is the most important ethical issue. Then when you bring him, if you don't question him, but feed him before, you feed him or her, and then you always question, where do you come from? So Fanon says, um, when the traveler comes in, he, they know that he's another brother, Muslim brother, etc. Everything is okay, they feed him. But he says, the, the traveler, even if he's of the same nationality, language, tradition, uh, dietary habits, always creates an anxiety around him. This is what Fine said. He's just doing an ethnographic study. Why does he create an anxiety around him? And this is very beautiful. He says, because the hosts realize that he is speaking the same language, but they don't know under what sky he learned that language. So, so the point is, the point, it's a very brilliant point. It's a, actually a linguistic point. That the signifier, he might say bread, but the notion of bread in where he comes from or the notion of thank you. So the signifier is in where the anxiety lives. And I believe that that is, that to be able to think about the anxiety as a relation, not only empathy or generosity, but to think about anxiety and hospitality is important for me. Shall we just take a break and ask whether there are any comments or questions from the floor? Anything that you want to share? Let me just, can I just say one thing on this anxiety? Just, yes. So anxiety is not a one-to-one -one thing. I'm thinking about institutions how institutions also think about this anxiety. Absolutely. Sometimes they blow it up to create such a panic that nobody wants to take in the refugee. But you cannot find it. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. But you have to be able to think about this, let's call it an ethical or moral anxiety. Well, take it 
my temptation is to plunge deep into a philosophical question, and so I withdraw myself because otherwise uh, we, we could stay here very long. But I don't know how much time do we have still. Um, I think, can we stay till seven or is it too late? No, okay. Um, 10 minutes most? Okay. May I have another, uh, because we, we just talked about language. Did you, you mentioned the, the, the questioning with the other, and so hospitality means also to translate myself into the other language and to translate the other's language yeah. into mine. So um, I have this question in my mind that your, your speech today um, was dramatically important in, in the weeks we are living. But I think that uh, also before these weeks, also before, it's, it's a sort of ultra-temporal uh, problem in, in philosophy, in anthropology, um, how to avoid the nihilism of the otherness if I speak only one language, we are trying to communicate with each other. We are living in a pluralistic society. We know that uh, on this planet, human beings speak uh, some 5,600 languages. How come that English is the overall globalized and globalized language. So you, you also talked about the risk, freedom and risk. So my question is, shouldn't we risk the possibility of translating and not only speaking a dominating language? Now we are communicating in English and that's right and that's good we can understand, and the majority of people can understand. But I think that we always have to bear in mind the fact that thought and language influence each other. And so we have to pass, to move, and to translate, going into plurality of languages. What, what do you think about this? I completely agree with you. I'm uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm the failed principle of what you have just proposed. So I agree with you. I don't know what I can, personally, what I can do with it because the languages I speak um, easily uh, are, are, are languages in which I don't work. But, but you know, I, but the one of the, for me, one of the most important Con uh, one of the most important elements of hospitality is translation. But in two forms. You know, um, uh, and, and this idea is uh, one that I've worked on. The intralinguistic translation is absolutely crucial that I find from your text, I find the best language to communicate in Hindi or, or whatever, the best form to communicate your intentions and your ideas, that I maintain something, that when somebody reads it, it I, they know it comes from you. But there is also um, the other larger problem, uh, which is less philological, and I, the, this problem is also philosophical, but I think there's a larger, philosophical question uh, about, uh, about culture and translation. And that is, um, uh, the, 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 I forget the phrase used by Derrida, uh, by Benjamin in his translation essay, but the distinction he said, makes is that if for, the, if for bread you want to find an equivalent and in India, we might say chapati or naan. Here, you might say pane. You know, you know, you can always find that. But the real form of hospitable communication is to be able to to 
tell, to be able to represent what it means for a Frenchman to put the baguette under his armpit and walk home every evening to break the baguette. Uh, or for the, the, the house, the people in America to take bread and put it in the freezer and pull it out. It could have been bought eight months ago. Or to go to Tuscany and eat the bread without the salt in it. So I think that there's a whole kind of cultural aura that is absolutely essential to intersubjective, or what Levinas would call interhuman uh, translation. And too often, it's absolutely crucial. If you could have everything translated in different languages, however well it was done or not, I think that would still be a huge thing. It would definitely knock the um, uh, it would knock at the, it knocked the sovereignty of, of English. But <clears throat> for English to be displaced, uh, there have to be so many things. You know, there has to be a culture of publishing, printing, reviewing. You know, in or in various languages, there has to be a sense that those languages also have a status. Uh, I was shocked to read that in Wikipedia till quite recently, there were more articles about uh, Spain than there were about large chunks of, uh, of, of Africa, huge, you know, and, and part of the, whole, uh, the African continent. So I think there are many institutional issues also connected with translation. We have to rethink the pedagogical and political system of, of communication. On the other hand, um, English is such a hospitable language, you know? It's pliable in many ways. It's, uh, okay, it was the imperial language. That's its fault, but uh, the language itself, you can't blame it. No, it's no, no. the use, and perhaps if we thought about words as wider semantic fields, you know, um, without using the jargon of global English, we would you know, find some common, more common terrain. I think, I I think you're absolutely right. And, but but, but be, to speak English, um, uh, but English is also so class and regional and, and, and ge geographically marked, you know, uh, that to, when I, when I hear an, an, an Asian, uh, somebody in Asian speaking in, 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 in America, second generation, I can't tell. But with English, you tell so many things. That's why novelists loved English. You could deal with class, you could deal with gender, you could deal with displacement. I mean, English is so sensitive uh, to all these, uh, to to all these very specific cultural codes. That's. Well, um, I'm afraid we need to keep some more <laughs> points for for dinner. Um, th there's one thing that really strikes me in your lecture, and I w I don't want to ask a question. I just put it there on the table, and the fact that you put Arendt and and Fanon together, mm. and that really triggers uh, some short circuit in, in what I know of both yeah. that we need to discuss, definitely. <laughs> um, because they hate him, because she was very critical of him. And, yeah, I don't understand the, how you can actually put them together when one you know, places uh, freedom in the hands of God, really, in the beginning. You know, God created man and woman, and, and, and this case, uh, this and, and freedom is a constitutive part of, of the origin of man and woman. And, and that, there you have religion coming into view, whereas Fanon says, oh, my body make me of me always a man who questions. Wow, question. uh, you know, the, the freedom of Fanon is totally materialistic, is, is actually ingrained in, in the physicality and the materiality of the body. So I don't know why. 
I know you, you used the wretched of the earth rather than dark skin white masks, yeah. you know, for as a reference, but that really intrigues me. Yeah, well, well, do you want me to talk now or no. to, tomorrow at the seminar? <laughs> no. Because tomorrow maybe. This is a question for the seminar tomorrow. So, so let, let's talk about this at the seminar because I think her use of God in that way is tropic. You know, she was, she was, not she was not at all, absolutely not. And she even departed from her Judaism, you know, in, in any serious okay, way. Okay. But we can talk tomorrow. Okay. Well, so, thanks everybody for coming. I'm very grateful to you, Majel. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa, thank you, so thank you much. from us all. Thank you. Come again. Grazie a tutti. Grazie per essere stati qui. Grazie fondamentalmente al professor Baba. Grazie. E ci rivediamo presto in uno dei prossimi eventi dedicati all'ottocentenario. Grazie a tutti e a tutte.